Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to In Limbo Conversations. Today we have with us Dr. Alexis Patton. She is a bioethicist and a medical sociologist. Uh, she is also a lecturer in social epidemiology and the sociology of health at Aston University in Birmingham. Uh, she's also the chair of the Committee on Ethical Issues in Medicine at the Royal College of Physicians and a trustee of the Institute of Medical Ethics. So thank you very much for joining us today, Dr. Patton. And yes, of course. Thank you very much for talking to us. Um, so there aren't many voices out there that are talking about the importance of ethics and the social sciences in our response to the pandemic. And if there are, then they're not as vocal or they're not heard as much. But uh, you and your colleagues have been doing a lot of work to sort of highlight that end of it. So we'd like to talk, we're hoping that we can talk about that and that this helps others see this particular perspective of dealing with the pandemic that they may not have previously considered. So uh, I'd like to thank, I'd like to sort of, uh, sorry, begin with, um, by touching on some points in your essay, fairness, ethnicity, and COVID-19 ethics. Okay. Uh, so in that you highlight how the existing guidance inadvertently discriminates against people from ethnic minority backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And uh, so before we talk about that, could you just uh, explain to us what ethical guidance is, why it's important and like, how does it work out in real life situations? Yeah. So, I mean, ethic guidance is um, incredibly important for a lot of those everyday scenarios where we're going to be coming up against um, dilemmas or problems. Um, and, you know, in particular, um, ethics guidance can be seen in almost every field um, and it comes in many different forms. And many people will recognize their kind of day to day ethics coming from some kind of um, sort of moral or religious background that they may have that helps them guide them make decisions. And then when we move ethics guidance into something um, like a professional field, such as medicine, then that really helps us work out those very tricky scenarios where we may have competing interests um, for a, a patient or a, in the pandemic where we may be finding ourselves in a situation of um, difficulty providing resources or staff or care, then ethics guidance is really an, an important um, tool that we can use to figure out, okay, what is um, the best way forward here? And I think it's important to remember that um, one of the things that people can sometimes find frustrating with ethical guidance is that it won't always give you the same answer. Um, and this is because the guidance is being used in a particular context at a particular time. And so it may give you one best way forward in a particular set of circumstances and then a new best way forward in, in the different set of circumstances. Um, and, in, and here in Britain, um, you know, it's been very interesting. We've been really taking this kind of follow the science uh, roadmap approach to the pandemic, um, which ethics is really, if you want to think about it in that roadmap analogy, ethics is really like the cartographer. So it can show us um, the right road to take in this roadmap, so to speak. Um, and it really helps us determine not just what we can do, but what we should do. Yeah. So uh, to take your point about how they've been following science, especially in the UK and other countries, uh, and if I can quote from an article of yours recently from The Independent, where you say that this particular attitude uh, perpetuates a myth about science, that it is somehow morally neutral, it's objective, that eliminates only one way forward to deal with the particular mm -hmm. problem. So uh, this is also kind of the main point of that uh, essay that I sort of uh, quoted earlier, where you're trying to say that the relationship between fairness and equity in healthcare is not the same. Like, even though it seems like we're being fair, but it doesn't mean we're being equal, which is kind of a little hard, which is a bit, not hard, but it's a, it's a little counterintuitive, if you will, or it's not as easy to follow. So uh, could you tell us how that sort of plays out? Why is it that being fair is not always being equal, especially when it comes to minorities? I think um, a lot of it comes with the fact that, um, you know, fairness, equality, and equity are all slightly different things. Um, and in particular, um, you know, and, and I'll say I can only mostly talk about the UK yeah. medical context because that's what I um, I know best. But in, in particular here in the UK, we have a real problem between equality and equity in healthcare. 
So while everyone theoretically has equal access to the NHS, for example, the equity of services, the availability of services to different people throughout the country is not the same. So it's actually not equal. Um, and as a result, we have an inequity. And, and that's why I really wanted to pick up this idea of fairness, because fairness assumes that we are all coming at the pandemic, to use that example, from an equal footing. And we are not. So we already know, and, and um, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing how much has moved on since I wrote that particular essay. So that I wrote that in April, and now we're sitting here in October, and we know so much more. Um, and in a way, I think makes my essay stronger. So we know, for example, that if you live in an area of deprivation or you live in deprivation, you're much more likely to have a poor outcome from COVID-19 than you are coming from a more privileged background. And that's just talking about finances as an example. But also, um, this is, there's a problem in equity in terms of the kind of health that you're coming um, that you that you have as we enter the pandemic. Um, and in our country, at least in the UK, there's there are some real problems. There are some huge health inequalities. So there are unequal um, um, health for different uh, segments of the population, and also there is a lot of health inequity. So the populations that are most likely to be unhealthy are also the populations that have the least like likely ability to access the healthcare services that they need. So it's a real double whammy um, as we sort of come into the, the pandemic. And if we take as fairness our, our footing for writing any of the guidance on the pandemic without considering, um, you know, the fact that people are not coming into the pandemic on an equal footing, then we are already disadvantaging huge groups of the population. So we're disadvantaging anyone who, who um, lives or works in deprivation, but we're also disadvantaging, um, you know, a number of um, the ethnic minority population in our group as well, which in the UK, um, you know, there's a, has, I would say, is coming from a very unequal point where they often are also living in deprivation or in low socioeconomic um, conditions. And then also have a propensity towards um, some of the nastier underlying conditions that we know make for poor COVID outcomes. Um, so for example, um, any kind of cardiac underlying condition um, has been shown to have a, a poor outcome in, in COVID. And in the UK, um, three of our major um, ethnic minorities, so the South Asian population, um, the African population and the Black Caribbean population all tend to have a tendency towards these cardiac underlying conditions as well. So it's, um, it's sort of, as, as you see, as I sort of build up the different layers of, I guess, inequity or, or inequality there, um, you can see how if you are a kind of uh, privileged white person, then you are coming at, you're already walking into the pandemic at a distinct advantage. And then if we make guidelines that don't consider these differences, then it, it, it further privileges a particular um, group in the population to have better outcomes and to serve and better survival rates in the pandemic. So uh, do you feel that social sciences is what helps us make these ethical guidelines or how does, how, how do, how does social sciences play a role with uh, helping us form these guidelines and sort of keep this in mind? So I think, so I come from the social sciences in doing empirical work. So I like to go out and talk to people, observe people in the field to see how it is that we do things, where the problems lie. And I think that that kind of work is incredibly important when we make guidelines for two reasons. So um, first I'm gonna talk about guidelines in general, and then I'm gonna talk specifically about ethical guidance. So with guidelines in general, we know in particular in medicine that if guidelines are written without reference to the context in which they will um, sort of be carried out, that they tend to miss very important practical day-to-day um, -day things that happen in a ward, for example, that mean that certain aspects of the guidelines simply cannot be carried out. And so this is one of those dangers of kind of writing in a vacuum. If you sit back and think, oh, well, you know, these steps make sense, uh, we should do them. But if you don't realize that in order to get from, for example, step one to step two, uh, you require an extra person, an extra member of staff, or you need a, and this I've seen this before, you need just um to be able to transfer from a ward on a level plane, so that there's no stairs, for example, then what you find is you can never get to step two, 
And so three, four, and five don't happen either. So social science is a really great way of showing the, the context, the contextual factors in which guidance will be carried out. And I think it's very important for all guidance, and in particular, any kind of clinical guidance, that they be trialed in situ so that we can do this type of work. We can observe how guide, where the guidance um, where the sticking points are for the guidance and how it is that we can help the guidance evolve so that it accounts for these issues. And then in ethical guidance, we have a, we have a further issue. So, you know, ethics does have a bit of a tension in it. There's a, um, you know, there is a raging, continually raging debate between um, a more philosophical, theoretically based um, ethics and an empirical ethics. So I obviously I'll put my hand up. I fall on the empirical side of things. Um, and I am even more strange because I fall on the we can do ethics with social sociology side of things. So I'm a, I'm a bit of a rare bird, but um, though there's, there's, there's a, a growing flock of us, I will say. Um, and, uh, and what's interesting about ethics guidance is that in particular with things like fairness, it's important to remember that a number of the principles that we use in medical ethics are derived from philosophy that are several hundred years old and have, have not and could not have conceived of the medical scenarios that we now use these principles in. And so in that way, you know, looking back on what I was talking about, about how clinical guidance needs to be developed in context, we well, can imagine how much more removed ethical guidance is when it chooses to prioritize some of these, um, uh, I don't want to say older principles, because that's not right, but principles that were developed long in a, further in our history. And it's very important for thing, guidance, um, for ethical guidance in medicine to be practical and to speak to the practical profession in which it will be used. So again, social science is a really great place to do that. And in the guidance that we were developing for the Royal College of Physicians, there was, there was loads of social science research that had been done that was incredibly helpful. So for example, one of the raging debates in our UK media was about whether doctors should be heroes that lay down their lives for their patients. You know, and, and we and there was a huge debate about this. You know, by um, saying that they were our superheroes, we were implying that we expected them to lay down their lives for us and others. Well, go back a few years to um, previous pandemics, and work out of Canada had actually found that in SARS and H and in the H one N one pandemics that that came previously, uh, the public had no expectation that doctors should do this. So they did um, some interviews and focus groups and observed some town hall events where they asked the public this question. And it was fairly unanimous that they had no expectation that doctors should die for their patients. So while we're raging these debates in the media and there was discussions about whether duty of care, um, which is a medical ethics concept, um, should encompass dying for their patients. Actually, what we did is if you went and looked at the, the data on what people really thought about this, it was that they thought, no, absolutely not doctors should not die for their patients. So that's just a small example of how social science can be incredibly helpful in how we craft guidance. Because if we don't go and we don't refer to that kind of work that's out there, then we can end up creating guidance that is, um, you know, first of all, I think un unfair to uh, doctors as an example, as for this particular example, but also doesn't capture the sort of normativity that the public has around this, around the the, the morality that they think is attached to it. And so you end up with guidance that is disconnected from the context it's going to be used and the people who need to use it. So it's not only important to use social sciences, but it's also, uh, at least from your perspective, to focus on the empirical, the present day thing more than the theoretical, because there's always this within social sciences, it's always a schism between uh, empirical approaches and the theoretical thing. So I do feel there's a lot of that. So you, 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 you'd, like you said, you'd, you'd uh, fall more to the side of the empirical because it's more important to do the present day scenarios, I guess, to focus on what is well, happening. Well, for me, I think for me, it's, um, it's that we can use the empirical to inform the theoretical. They don't have to be divorced at all. And the theories that exist are great ones to start with, and some of them don't need to be changed. But what we need to do is have a kind of continual process where we check back in 
on how the theories are being used in practice, how they're operationalized in policy, how they're taught in medical schools, and how they're perceived by the staff and the public who need to use them. And then be open to the fact that sometimes we're getting it wrong and we need to change and we need to adapt. Um, and you know, there was a big move, for example, when, we, when um, patient autonomy became a very paramount bioethical principle, this move from paternalism was a huge step forward and, and really only happened in the 20th century. I think sometimes people forget this. This is sort of like a latter half of the 20th century move that happened in medicine. And then we see in um, kind of the late 20th century, moving into the 21st century, a move towards what's called shared decision making. Um, as, as another example, and this came out of empirical work around how patients wanted to be making decisions with doctors. And it's now become something that we use a lot in, in the NHS. You know, there's whole web pages about how this is an important um, theory and concept that you must um, use in your practice in the NHS. But what's interesting is that now there's new empirical work saying that we're, we may not be getting it totally right when we, you know, we think we're doing shared decision making, but we haven't quite got there for a number of, of reasons. Um, you know, a lot to do with uh, lingering power dynamics between patients and doctors, a huge amount to do with how little time our doctors here in the UK have to spend with patients. You know, six to seven minutes is a, not a lot of time to, to build trust and, and develop a relationship with someone to make a shared decision. Um, and so now I think that's an example where um, we've We've been using particular theory and then we've also been slowly refining it with empirical practice. And I think now we're at a new point where we have to have another think about whether what we call shared decision-making right now, perhaps needs to, that, that theory needs to be um, refined again based on how it's being used in practice. Yeah, so it's pretty interesting. But if I can move from the uh, sort of academic professional space to a more public space, and yeah. uh, one of the things that you highlight a lot in your work is not a lot, but recently you've highlighted how the government has been resistant to considering these things, especially mm -hmm. with regards to ethnic minorities. Uh, why do you think that is? Is there any particular reason why the resistance? I, I think, I think a lot of it has to do with. I try not to be cynical. Try to be <laughs> um, uh, helpful. I. I I think partially it's because mitigating a lot of these factors, you know, dealing with health inequalities, dealing with the inequities um, that people from ethnic minority backgrounds have to deal with in their health and, and their whole lives is a costly endeavor. And at least in the UK, we, we are with a government that favors austerity over everything else. And, you know, to mitigate health inequalities, we need to improve things like housing and urban landscapes we need to improve public transport we need to improve food quality and the and food provision you know the list kind of goes on and on and and all of those things are important things that i believe we need to do um, but the government just sees those i think as pound signs that they have to to pay out for so i, I don't know if it's the uk government as a whole forever that is resistant to this or if it's this particular government that we have, um, as I said, has been favoring austerity for a very long time now. So uh, if I was to go a bit, I, I understand that the question I asked you and the one I'm about to ask don't really have any particular answers. But uh, since you are somebody who's working very closely with a lot of these things, I'd just like to get your thoughts on this. Like you mentioned, uh, the government has this uh, certain attitude could be a product of the present times and all of those. There's also the popular perception of the pandemic or how people in general sort of uh, deal with it or sort of think about it. Uh, like you mentioned, your article was in April and around that time when I was doing a bit of research, I found that a lot of uh, news reports and articles in May, April, May, June, where they highlighted this uh, uh, ethnicity, the relationship between COVID and ethnicity in the UK. And uh, where they talk a lot about Sometimes there's a you know bit of racism. They bring in a bit of talk about how this might be implicitly racist or systemic systemic racism. Mm -hmm. And uh, there seems to be a you know sort of a different uh, way that people deal with this. So, for example, if I was to say in popular media, at least on social media, you'll see a lot of people 
talking about vitamin D. That's a popular narrative about how COVID goes. That, oh, you know, ethnic minorities don't have the required required vitamin D, and that's why they can't. Uh, that's why they are more. It's not systemic racism. It's, it's not systemic problems. It's just that you know, it's just a simple mm-hmm. matter of not having enough vitamin D and all of those things. So, as somebody who makes these guidelines, as somebody who works in these things, how uh, d- does this factor into any of your? Uh, how do you sort of make sense of people? Yeah. Who use attitudes. And- this is not the first time someone's asked me that question, and it's something that I've been thinking about a lot. So, yeah, we've had a huge amount of coverage here in the UK about how it's, it could just be biology, um, or worse, some of it's like, oh, it's just the culture mm-hmm. of this group. Um, so, for example, when we had our Leicester lockdown, um, you know, we've got a really big ethnic minority background, um, a big South Asian af- uh, background in in Leicester, and people were saying, oh, it's just their culture to mix. And you just, and for me, I find that very frustrating because it shows that in the popular perception, there's very little understanding of what um, social and health inequalities look like and what systemic, ra- how systemic racism feeds into those. So, you know, there, there are, um, it's undeniable that some groups are more susceptible to particular underlying conditions than others. Um, that's something that, um, happens across all ethnic backgrounds. Um, but one of the things that I thought was really interesting is that when we consider how, for example, um, South Asian, people from a South Asian background are, are often more susceptible to heart conditions, um, they've done, we've done research, I'm sorry, I've not done research, there has been research that's been done that's looked at if you, um, if you look at a, a a group that are South Asian and living in lower economic status in higher levels of deprivation, then those underlying conditions increase. And if they are able to be living in a more privileged financial background, then that actually those underlying conditions and the and the likelihood of um, having a cardiac problem decreases. So what we know is that you can't just say it's biology. You you have to take into account what these inequities are doing, and we have to in the UK and across the. Um, the, the world, uh, we have to recognize that a lot of these inequities start with systemic racism. That's that's where they start. So we have a, a group of people, so in the UK, we're having a group of people who were originally um, immigrating from different countries. A number of them have been here for generations now. Um, but when they were first coming, there was a level of racism that limited what the potential that was available to them. Um, you know, they're and there are whole stories about generations of, of families that, you know, start in one particular job because that's the only thing they could be hired to do. Something that when we look in 2020 back, think, oh my God, that's insane. That's just appalling that anyone would do that. That and and but those that type of sort of systemic racism is what feeds into people's abilities to get the education that they want or need, um, work in the job that they would like. Um, have the stability that they need for the houses that they would like to live in. And all of those things are wrapped up in how healthy we are. Uh, it's very interesting. And I think it's a very complicated thing to navigate as well. Uh, d- does it sort of seep into the professional space as well? Or is it like something that's uh, sort of relegated to a public consciousness? Do any of these things find their way into professional or governmental? You mean, does systemic racism find its way into professional? It is, yeah. Do you, do you have to deal with it more than? I think it, it cuts across all bits of society, you know, and I'm sure that my colleagues from ethnic minority backgrounds would have a number of appalling stories to tell you about the systemic racism that fit, that is in academia. Um, I can, you know, I've definitely witnessed some pretty bad incidents in in medicine. Um, and so I think that the, that is still very alive and well, and and we need to be aware of that. I mean, one of the interesting things that, I, that we tried to pick up on um, when we were putting the guidance together um, for the pandemic, and also I gave some evidence to parliament about the impact of COVID on ethnic minority backgrounds as well, is that um, doctors from ethnic minority backgrounds are much less likely to speak up in a, if there's a safety concern because they have experienced that the repercussions on them are significantly worse than on their white counterparts. 
And so I got quite worried and I'm still quite worried that we're in a scenario where we may run out of PPE as an example, that we have over, well, somewhere around 50, probably more if we consider healthcare assistants and porters and things like that. Um, about half of our um, healthcare staff are from an ethnic minority background here in the NHS. So we're talking about a group that are on the front line in the pandemic who are known to have worse outcomes from COVID than their um, than the white population. We are looking, we're facing down a possible PPE vaccine and um, uh, drug um, shortage in the UK. And we have a group who feel less comfortable speaking up about safety concerns because of repercussions to themselves that if they were a white doctor or a white nurse or a white healthcare assistant, they wouldn't feel that same pressure. To me, that's just a perfect storm and shows how that's all about systemic racism. It has nothing to do about where they've come from, you know, their biology, anything like that. That is about systematic racism and how that is still very alive and well in our society. Yeah. Right. Uh, and I think I have just one last question. Which, yeah. Uh, so, is there are there any cases other than the present COVID case where social sciences or certain guidelines or sort of uh, insights from social sciences have really a helped uh, fight certain pandemics or certain problems, or b where if they had been considered, they might have helped a lot more. Is there like a positive and negative like? Do you have any examples that you can tell? Yeah, so I mean, Canada is a really great place to start. So um, it's also my native country. <laughs> I'm not biased, though I promise. Um, and uh, in the in the SARS, the original SARS pandemic, um, the 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 work that came out of Canada and the guidelines that came out of Canada and the hospitals in some of the hotspots, they really did take into account the social sciences here. And they were watching and talking and interviewing. And um, in the pandemic guidance that exists, um, that that does take into account that the, the social sciences. And, and they were kind of rolled in from the beginning. So a number of the papers that come, came out of that group showed that from the very start, the social, social science was there you know, contributing to um, the the work that was done there. And, and a lot of the work that they did afterwards um, to see whether the guidance was the appropriate guidance and fit with what was needed is a really important um, uh, resource for those of us working in this pandemic now, because it shows us what worked and what didn't. And I think that's very important. Um, to, so that we're able to improve and refine as we move forward in this pandemic and, and likely in more pandemics in our lifetime as well. In terms of where social science could be better used, um, you know, I think there's a, there's a few places. Um, I think social science could be better utilized in the way we do medical ethics education um, and the and the guidance that we have around what doc, what it is that doctors need to learn for that. Um, I think social science would provide us a significant amount of context for that. And in general, I would say that you need a social scientist every time you write policy. You, you need to be able to look at the context in which that's, that policy will be used. Because if you don't, you are setting that policy up for failure. Thank you, Doctor. Um, yeah, no hopefully problem. people can follow up these examples if they want to see more. Um, uh, yes. <laughs> But uh, we've mentioned all of uh, uh, Dr. Patton's work down in the links and on the YouTube description. So if any of you want to see more or read more about that, please do go there and check it out. But uh, thank you very much for sharing the insights with us. Hopefully it helps people see another aspect of battling this pandemic and uh, other social scientists also to see this, the importance of it. So thank you very much for talking to us. And uh, yes, it, was, it was a pleasure. Thank you very much.